It's exactly that. It's basically how do you use multiple technologies to cover the blind spots of others? Yeah, so it's like, how do you drive the cost down? How do you improve the technology? How do you make the algorithm better and better and better? Because it is under, under all of this is a huge engine of machine learning mm. that makes it better over time. You know, exercise is so important, right? It, it can't be overstated. It's potentially one of the most potent drugs we have. But all exercise is not created equal, I would imagine. Correct. For and this purpose. Ab absolutely. Um, and so I, I think of exercise as having four pillars. And um, you have to be strong on each of those. So if you're strong in three but not in one, it's sort of like a table that has three legs and not one. It's still a reasonable table, but it's not as strong as a table with four legs. And a table with two legs is pretty pathetic. And obviously a table with one leg is not a table. <laughs> so the four pillars are stability, strength, aerobic efficiency, and anaerobic performance. And I think that most people understand loosely what three of those are. Could you say those all one more time? Sure. Stability. Mm -hmm. That's the one that most people don't understand. We can talk about that in a minute. Strength, mm -hmm. aerobic efficiency, and anaerobic performance. Got so it. I guess we can unpack all of them, but stability is the ability to safely transfer load from the outside world to the body and vice versa, which sounds sort of like a... I don't know, kind of a, a soft ex explanation. Um, an analogy that I really like using is that of a race car versus a street car. So what makes race cars so unique is that, and why, by the way, a race car that's got half the power of a street car will still knock its socks off on a track is because the chassis and the tires of the race car are constructed in such a way that every bit of that power is making it to the road. So the analogy I like to think of is that the tires of a race car are like our feet and stability really does begin with the feet. And most people, myself included, when I was starting had horrible proprioception with our feet. Um, you know, we don't really know how to load our feet correctly. And a lot of that comes from the fact that we wear shoes all day. Um, your hands and your feet are actually very similar. And if you think about what you can do with your hands, how easily you can move them around, spread your fingers, sense pressure in different areas most people can't do that with their feet and that that comes to comes to bite you so um as you think about how it moves up the the sort of chain um a very common problem is uh a, the which i think accounts for probably more of the injuries that people experience is this pattern where the pelvis is tilted forward the ribs are flared up the erector spinae muscles in the back are sort of locked short, meaning they're locked, like they, they're locked in concentric load and the hamstrings are locked long. So they're locked yeah. in eccentric load, which actually, so, so you've asked me a question and I think that I can answer this with, there are really two things I'm excited about that pertain to exercise and yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go down up. this path and then we'll come back to the other one. Um, so what's the, what's the etiology of that position, which I was the king of that position? Um, it's probably, what do you mean by etiology? Like where, do, what drives that? Why would mm -hmm. a person show up with that posture of mm -hmm. ribs flared up, pelvis tilted forward, back tight, hamstrings tight and long. Oh, it probably starts with lousy respiration. And, and I'm not exactly sure why that's the case, but I, I think somewhere along the way we stop learning or we stop breathing correctly into our abdomen. Right, so we, instead of breathing the way we should breathe, which is the diaphragm should go down, the abdomen should come out, the pelvis should actually fill with pressure. We tend to breathe using, so that's the, those are the primary muscles of respiration as the diaphragm. We start using accessory muscles like the pec and the pec minor, and we kind of lift the chest up. This is a very common pattern of respiration. And I think it's that lifting of the chest that is what's bringing the rib cage up. And when that happens, the body is a little bit out of balance, uh, meaning your center of mass shifts forward. And the body senses that, and in an effort to prevent you from falling forward, it's basically tightening those erector spinae muscles. It's, it's pulling you into balance again. But in doing so, it's creating this downstream problem in the hamstrings, which is they're just, they're locking. and. If there's another thing I've become really obsessed with, it's hamstring control, which is different from hamstring strength. 
Um, a lot of people, myself included, can have very strong hamstrings. I used to have incredibly strong hamstrings if you put me on a machine and made me do something in isolation, but I could never recruit them. So uh, a simple exercise to demonstrate this, which Beth Lewis had me do for the first time, maybe two and a half or three years ago, was you laying on your back with your knees up and your feet down. So you're sort of in a back position, knees up, you know, feet on the surface of the ground. And without letting your back tilt into a huge, you know, make a huge dome underneath it. So while keeping your lower, lower back, back flat, can you with one leg pull very, very hard back to your butt and feel your hamstring tense? So that is a very specific manner of recruiting hamstring strength. And believe it or not, I couldn't do that with that while keeping my back down. My back, would, I would arch like a cat if I tried to do that. There were many more of these types of exercises, but it was through this type of very deliberate, you know, starting on my back and then learning to do hamstring recruitment while standing and while feeling pressure in my feet that really allowed me to get back to deadlifting with a feeling of safety that I'd never really experienced. Because I used to deadlift so heavy when I was young and basically got away with using my back to deadlift, which is obviously not what you want to do. And then I just started having nagging injuries as I got older. So by the time I was in my mid forties, I'm deadlifting and it's like, oh, my SI joint would bug me. And after I'd finish, my back would just feel tight. Um, so it, it's sort of, you know, what age sort of uh, exposes your deficiencies and eventually everybody's going to sort of pay a price for this. Some people do these things naturally better than others. So I think there are some people who can kind of go their entire life lifting heavy weights without having to pay much attention to this stuff. But, you know, I certainly wasn't one of them. There are a couple different schools of thought that have been implemented into this training, one of them being dynamic neuromuscular stabilization or DNS, which is heavily focused on this ability to find the breath and generate, uh, you know, this concentric abdominal pressure. So creating a cylinder inside the abdomen, as opposed to like an upside down triangle where you have some pressure up here, but none down here. And then another school of thought that's been heavily influential here has been something called Postural Restoration Institute or PRI. And that's, that's really the one that has focused on this idea of how do you correct what from the side looks like this, right? You know, sort of pelvis down, ribs up, and how do you fix that position? And, and um, again, it's, it's, it's hard because it requires fixing everything from the feet to the neck. You have to sort of think about it as the positive and the negative, right? So one drawback of sitting is that you're not active. So it's it's simply the removal of active time that is a problem. And I think the other problem with sitting is it is simply harder to generate um, intra-abdominal pressure. And it's easier to just rely on these accessory movements of respiration to lift up. So, you know, I... I think I've said this once before, like if I could be czar for a day, you know, I'd go back to kids when they're in school and, you know, have them in standing desks or squatting. Those would be your two positions, right? So you either, you're kind of squatting to do work or you're standing to do work, but you're not sitting in the types of chairs that we sit in. Oh, so the other thing on exercise, to get back to your question about the metabolic stuff is, you know, about three years ago, I was becoming more and more interested in this idea of zone two training, uh, which has a very technical definition, and then we can explain proxies for it. But the definition of zone two is the highest level of output you can produce while keeping lactate below two millimole. So mm -hmm. um, lactate is a byproduct of anaerobic metabolism. So when we're sitting here at rest, our lactate level is probably one if we're metabolically healthy. There are some people who sit around at rest higher than two. Um, but if anybody's done lactate testing knows, you know, as you start exerting yourself more and more, your lactate will rise. And, you know, peak levels in highly trained individuals can reach above 20 millimole. And that's accompanied by remarkable discomfort, actually. So um, I've always done lactate training when I was, you know, being an athlete, which I haven't been in forever. Um, but I was never focused on this aspect of it. I was always focused on something called lactate threshold and peak lactate. So peak lactate for me was kind of a marker of just how much pain I could endure. And lactate threshold was a marker of the highest amount of output I could produce 
um, for relatively short races. Um, like, you know, meaning short for me would be like half an hour or something like that. So knowing my lactate threshold was important for that stuff. But this zone two stuff is way below that, right? Zone two is by definition, your all day pace. It's basically at a lactate level of two, you should be able to go all day because that's the that's the level at which you do not net accumulate. So you're producing, but you're not right. accumulating. And so it's the rate at which clearance equals production and you stay at that level of two. So does that